Hello, Professor John Blakeman here from the UW Stevens Point Political Science Department, and welcome back to my ongoing lecture series on the U.S. Constitution, sponsored by the UW Stevens Point Alumni Association and their Alumni College experience. So this is lecture number 12, and this is the last lecture on presidential power in the Constitution, and then we've got lectures 13 and 14 on the First Amendment Free Speech Clause, so be sure to stick around for those. So this lecture is on a case from 1952, Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer, otherwise known as the Steel Seizure case. And it concerns whether the president, in this case, President Harry S. Truman, whether the president can seize an entire industry in the United States. And well, I'll talk about the facts of the case in a few seconds, but briefly, we have President Truman, the Korean conflict, and the United Steelworkers Union threatening to go on strike. Truman's response is to seize and operate the entire steel industry in order to make sure that steel is manufactured for the American war effort. So it's a very, very interesting case. One thing we really pay attention to in this case is a concurring opinion written by Justice Robert Jackson. And I will talk about that in a lot more detail in the lecture. There are also a couple of interesting and, and entertaining stories about the case at the very end of the lecture too. Um, so be sure to stick around for those. So Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer or otherwise called the Steel Seizure Case, 1952. Um, it really does focus our attention on the president's power over national security and the president's inherent power, sometimes what we call the president's emergency power. And in 1934, in a very famous case, Blaisdell versus uh, Home Building and Loan, or vice versa, uh, which actually doesn't concern presidential power, but concerns a, a state's attempt to address Depression-era economic issues based on what the state decided was an economic emergency, the Supreme Court said that in and of itself, an emergency or a crisis does not create power but, <clears throat> excuse me, the emergency may furnish the occasion for the exercise of power. And that's an important point to keep in mind, because as presidents act to meet a national crisis, a national emergency, we do have to keep in mind that the emergency itself doesn't create the power the president needs or uses. The power either exists prior to the emergency or not. And the emergency might be the occasion to use some kind of power that is not normally used, but the emergency itself does not expand or contract the powers of our institutions. Now, to put this in perspective for you, especially when we get to uh, the, the, the presidency and the constitution, with World War II and then beyond, we see all the way to the present day for that matter, we see a real expansion of presidential power under the Constitution. A lot of that expansion has been granted and approved by Congress, no question about that. But in a lot of other instances, the president seems to be acting on his own and using a broad interpretation of presidential authority to do something. And so a couple of examples that come out of World War II uh, what we call the Japanese internment cases, Hirabayashi versus U.S. and Korematsu versus the United States. Both of those cases are very, very important. Both are well worth reading. In both cases, we look back in hindsight and say the Supreme Court was absolutely wrong in what it did. In both those cases, the Hirabayashi case concerns an executive order by President Roosevelt that places a curfew on all Japanese Americans who reside in the, in the Western military zone of the United States, which, which is basically the Western part of the Rockies all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And certainly President Roosevelt had clear national security priorities, but by treating a whole group of people based on their ethnicity and nationality, uh, and treating them, forcing them into a curfew, that raises, of course, very significant questions of discrimination, racial, ethnic discrimination, to be sure. The same with Korematsu versus U.S. And the, the Korematsu case, we refer to it as the Japanese internment case. 
it is the case where the Supreme Court validated President Roosevelt's executive order to exclude all Japanese Americans from the Pacific coast and to move them inland to internment facilities in, in Arizona and New Mexico and Colorado and Eastern Washington. Those Japanese Americans, almost all of them were citizens. They had their property taken away from them. Uh, they were effectively denied the use of their property. They were forced to evacuate and live in a camp with other Japanese Americans. It's not until 19, the late 1980s that Congress issues an apology and passes some kind of minimal compensation for the harm done. In hindsight, we could argue perhaps that Roosevelt was wrong and that the Supreme Court was wrong for validating his executive order. But as the court points out in Korematsu versus the United States, uh, and it was a bare majority, by the way, a five to four decision. The five justices in the majority agree that war is a time of hardship and it will be citizens who feel that hardship. Anyway, I recommend reading those two cases because they are very important in, in, our, in our constitutional history and, and perhaps interesting examples of where the Supreme Court perhaps got the decisions wrong. Ex parte Karen is another World War II case, <clears throat> excuse me, where President Roosevelt uses his authority as president uh, to put Mr. Karen on trial in a military commission which leads to his execution. Kieran is an American citizen who has gone back to Nazi Germany and he comes back to the United States as a commando in early 1942 with the intent to sabotage American industry. He doesn't even come close to committing uh, his deeds. He is arrested by the FBI. He's tried by a military commission, which means uh, he's tried in front of a jury comprised of military officers, uh, a judge, a military officer presides over the trial, and he's convicted. And Karen appeals his case all the way to the Supreme Court, claiming that as an American citizen, as an American citizen, he is entitled to the Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights to due process and a fair and speedy trial in front of uh, an impartial jury. Now, the Supreme Court fundamentally disagrees with Kieran and upholds presidential power. And they rule that Kieran is an American citizen, but he's also what we call an enemy combatant, someone who comes to the United States to wage war against the United States. A very interesting case as well. Those three cases and then several others, we see the presidency here, uh, President Roosevelt, expanding his authority during a time of national crisis. Uh, you know, honestly, from FDR all the way to the present day, 2020, pretty much every president has done that. We will see Truman doing that in the steel seizure case in just a minute. But President Eisenhower, President Kennedy, President Johnson, President Ford, President Nixon, uh, got them slightly out of order, sorry about that, President Reagan, um, President Clinton. President Bush, oh, got those two out of order as well. But all of them expanded their authority as presidents in some way or another. And this gets us to an interesting point about presidential power in the Constitution. What one president does, what one president does to slightly expand the power and the authority of the office, another president will continue. Doesn't matter which political party the president is from, presidents accept the whole suite of political power uh, that has been created from their predecessors. And every president wants to hand down that power and then some to his successor. It has more to do with the presidency as an institutionalized office, and it has very, very little to do with the partisanship or the political party that a president belongs to. Now, we talk about the rise of the national security state. And what this means is from World War II on to the present day, there's an increasing prominence of national security and presidential policy out of, out of all um, elected leaders in Western democracies throughout the world, elected executives, I should say, presidents and prime ministers. The American president 
uh, and focuses far more attention on national security issues than any other chief executive. And that's just part of America's role as a global superpower. But it has domestic ramifications here at home too, in that it raises very interesting and tricky constitutional questions for us. So let's get into the Youngstown case. Youngstown sheet and tube versus Sawyer. Yeah, here's another case about steel mills, but it is fundamentally different from NLRB versus Jones and Lachlan Steel. Although quite honestly, I sometimes get the two confused when I'm teaching class. So I don't know, it's just how it goes. But the case comes up in 1951, 1952 during the Korean conflict. Oops, sorry about that. During the Korean conflict. And in 1951, as America's steel production has ramped up to meet the needs of the military and to meet the needs of our ongoing conflict in, on the Korean Peninsula, the United Steel Workers call for a strike. And they plan to shut down many steel mills that are operating in the United States. In response, President Truman issues an executive order directing his Secretary of Commerce, Charles Sawyer, to seize and operate the steel mills to maintain production for the war effort. As Truman sees this, if the steel workers go on strike, if steel production comes to a grinding halt, that is a national security crisis. It will threaten the production of bombs and ships and tanks and other arms and ammunitions that we need to successfully fight the Korean conflict. And so Truman uses what he would call the aggregation of his presidential authority. I'll, I'll get to that point in a minute. But, but think about the total collective of his presidential power. And he declares that he has the authority to seize the steel mills, literally the entire industry, to operate it on behalf of the United States in order to maintain the production of steel. Otherwise, as Truman would argue, we have a national security crisis at home. There is a long history of presidents doing similar things uh, during the Civil War. President Lincoln authorized the federal seizure of a lot of property. Uh, during World War I, President Woodrow Wilson authorized the seizure of much of the rail industry, uh, the rail network, in order to move troops quickly from the west to the east where they could embark for the European theater. President Roosevelt did the exact same with the rail network and other property. So there is a history here of presidents seizing property during times of crisis in order to confront the crisis. Yet Truman's seizure seems to be a lot different. He's talking about or attempting to seize an entire industry in order to operate that industry on behalf of the United States. Needless to say, public opinion was not behind Truman. Congress was not very favorable either. And, you know, to bring us to the conclusion, in a sense, Truman loses the case at the U.S. Supreme Court six to three. But, you know, the political cartoons from the time depict Harry Truman as a, uh, a monarch, Harry the First, or we see the, the hand of the president crashing through the Constitution to seize the steel industry. Those two political cartoons are representative, in a sense, of how the nation viewed this. So, of course, the steel industry, several steel owners sue. And they demand that federal courts intervene and stop Truman from seizing their property, which is ultimately what the Supreme Court does. And there's another interesting twist here as well, which is, under a really important labor law, the Taft-Hartley Act, the president does have the authority granted to him by Congress to stop a strike temporarily. And the president can stop a strike and order a cooling off period. 
For whatever reason, Truman decides not to invoke the Taft-Hartley Act, probably because he was concerned that the cooling off period might not really work, that steel production would decline, be shut down anyway. Um, and plus, the, the halt to the strike would only have been temporary for a few weeks. So instead of invoking a power that Congress had given to him, President Truman uses, again, uh, the collective of his presidential power, all of his power in his aggregate to seize property and entire industry and operate it on behalf of the United States. And Truman, his, his ultimate argument boils down to the country is in a national crisis. There is an emergency. We have to have steel production. It cannot stop. Now, the Supreme Court, six to three rules against him. So, some of those justices were appointed by Truman, which makes Harry S. Truman livid. He doesn't understand how they could betray him the way they did. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, more importantly, though, there's a concurring opinion by Justice Robert Jackson that uh, turns out to be a very important statement about how we should judge presidential power and the Constitution going forward. And it's an example of a concurring opinion that is almost more important than the court's full opinion, because Justice Jackson's concurring opinion goes on to affect the development of constitutional law all the way to the present day. So let me get the case here. So the majority opinion, as I've edited here, is, is r relatively, relatively short. And Justice Black, writing for the Sixth Justice Majority, says, the president's power over here, the president's power, if any, to issue the order must stem either from an act of Congress or from the Constitution itself. Now, that's an important recognition on the part of the Supreme Court that the president, well, the president has independent authority under the Constitution, but the president can also be empowered to do something by Congress. We will come back to that point later. But Justice Black points out there's no statute that expressly authorizes the president to take possession of property as he did here. Nor is there an act of Congress to which our attention has been directed from which such a power could be fairly implied. Indeed, we do not understand the government to rely on statutory authorization for the seizure at all. So Truman's argument before the court really has nothing to do with power that he has been given by Congress. Truman really focuses the court's opinion, opinion on the Constitution and Article II, remember, which sets up the presidency. And so right here, Justice Black gets to the important point. The contention is that presidential power should be implied from the aggregate of his powers under the Constitution. And so what President Truman is arguing, or, or more, you know, his representative, the Solicitor General of the United States, the argument is basically, if we read Article II of the Constitution, and total up the aggregate of presidential power, the sum total of presidential power, then the sum total of power allows the president to seize the steel industry. A few things Truman mentions. For example, Truman says, well, the president is the commander in chief and we are in, at war in Korea, so therefore the commander in chief authority gives the president broad power domestically within the United States. The justices and the majority are unwilling to buy that argument. Truman says, okay, well, the president has the power to faithfully execute the laws, and that power must be construed broadly so that the president can confront any national crisis, any domestic crisis at home. But the court says the president's power, 
um, to execute the laws faithfully refutes the idea that he is to be a lawmaker. The Constitution limits his functions in the lawmaking process to the recommending of the laws he thinks wise, the president can submit legislation to Congress, and to, the, and to the vetoing of laws that he thinks unwise. And the Constitution is neither silent nor equivocal about who shall make the laws which the president is to execute. And so as the majority see it, President Truman is exercising a lawmaking function. <clears throat> He's making the law. He's ordering the seizure of private property. He's ordering the national government to produce something. And for the majority, it's fairly easy. The president doesn't have that constitutional authority at all. The president is not a lawmaker. And we do not agree that presidential power to seize property is implied from the aggregate of his powers in the Constitution. You could think for a second, the majority don't mention this, but you could think for a second how dangerous that doctrine might be if we agree with it. That it would be very easy for a president to say, well, the sum total of my authority in Article Two of the Constitution allows me to do basically anything I want. No, we don't have a monarch. We don't have a king. It's not like that at all. Okay. So um, the majority's reasoning is fairly straightforward, that the president cannot be the lawmaker. The president cannot order the seizure of property and the operation of an entire industry. Now, briefly, Justice Frankfurter, Felix Frankfurter, appointed by Franklin Roosevelt, um, one of the greatest justices in American constitutional history. He makes a couple of interesting points I think uh, are worth emphasizing, uh, but I'll, I'll keep this brief. He, he talks a little bit about the role of, of federal judges in these kinds of controversies. And, and he, he says um, that the narrow scope of the judicial function is especially demanded in controversies that arouse appeals to the Constitution. That when, when judges are considering constitutional disputes, they have to be narrowly focused. They, they don't want to give broad-based decisions. And Frankfurter says, so-called constitutional questions seem to, seem to exercise a mesmeric influence over the popular mind. Frankfurter really liked words. Um, the, this even is to settle, preferably forever, specific, a specific problem on the basis of the broadest constitutional pronouncement may not unfairly be called one of our minor national traits. Frankfurt, it's interesting, you know, Frankfurt is saying, look, the American public, they want us to resolve these constitutional conflicts with a broad decision. Uh, they are mesmerized, the people are mesmerized by these kinds of disputes. Maybe that's true. But what Frankfurter is saying, let's be very careful here. Let's decide this case without attempting to define the president's powers comprehensively. Let's decide the case as narrowly as possible. This is a point worth remembering down the road. So if the Supreme Court decides a constitutional dispute broadly, if it attempts to define the president's powers comprehensively in one single case, what if the justices make a mistake? What if they define presidential authority too broadly and we end up with a presidency that the framers of the Constitution did not anticipate, perhaps? Or what if they define presidential authority comprehensively, but in really narrow terms? And we end up with a chief executive that has very little authority to do much of anything at all. Now, some people might say, well, okay, that would be fine. Um, but, you know, lots of times we understand the president and the presidency, the office itself, needs flexibility 
in its power and authority, especially when it comes time to deal with a national crisis. So Justice Frankfurt is reminding us that judges need to be careful here, and they need to narrowly decide this case so that we don't give too much authority to the president in the future, but we don't constrain the president too much either. So let's jump to Justice Robert Jackson's concurring opinion. And his concurring opinion, again, is arguably the most important part of the Youngstown case. And so a couple of words about Justice Robert Jackson. He was a Supreme Court justice uh, up until, oh, maybe 19, I, I want to say 1943, appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. But he stepped down temporarily to go serve as the one of the main American prosecutors of the Nazi war criminals at the Nuremberg trials. And he comes back to the Supreme Court, I, I want to say approximately 1947 or 1948. And he comes back to the Supreme Court somewhat world-weary, but with this very interesting ex experience of having prosecuted people for heinous abuses of power. And arguably, after he comes back to the Supreme Court until his retirement in uh, short, well, actually shortly after the Youngstown case, uh, he seems a different person. He seems to have a different worldview about how the U.S. Constitution should be interpreted, or I should say a different worldview that influences his view of the U.S. Constitution. But Jackson's concurring opinion, he, he tells us that presidential powers are not fixed. They fluctuate, they change, they rise and fall, depending upon their disjunction or conjunction with those of Congress. What he's telling us is presidential power increases or decreases in relation to Congress. Okay, that's, I think, a simple way of looking at it. Presidential power is not fixed, but it fluctuates, and it fluctuates based on the relationship between presidential power and congressional power. Now, in the paragraph above, though, he makes an interesting point about constitutional interpretation. You have to read it carefully. Just what our forefathers did envision or would have envisioned had they foreseen modern conditions must be divined from materials almost as enigmatic as the dreams Joseph was called upon to interpret for Pharaoh. So I, I guess Justice Jackson, very grounded in the Old Testament here. But what he's saying is, uh, when we look to the framers of the Constitution, the forefathers, to, to help us figure out what the Constitution means, uh, their writings are enigmatic, often unclear, and they largely cancel each other out. A century and a half of partisan debate and scholarly speculation over the framers of the Constitution, the forefathers, yields no net result, but only supplies more or less apt quotations from respected sources on each side of any question. I like his footnote here. A Hamilton may be matched against a Madison. Now that's interesting. You know, uh, what Justice Jackson is saying is, look, we can dive into the framers' writings on the Constitution and other people of the era. We can look at scholarly interpretations of the writings of the framers, and we will find, we will find arguments on both sides of any constitutional debate. We will find Hamiltonians who argue for the energetic executive, we will find Madisonians who argue for a more separation of powers approach that will limit the president. And, and in a sense, Jackson is saying both are correct here. Both are correct. And they don't really give us a lot of guidance. So then he says, presidential power changes and fluctuates 
depending on its relationship to congressional power, its disjunction or conjunction with the powers of Congress. And this is where his concurring opinion becomes so important. He gives us a methodology, a formula for judging presidential power in the future. And it's fair to say that the formula he gives us is pretty much considered the constitutional law of today. It's uh, Justice Jackson's concurrence in Youngstown Cheating Tube is referred to frequently in congressional debates about presidential power. Presidents, White Houses rely on it to try to determine when the president has constitutional authority to do something or not. It's deeply, his concurring opinion is deeply embedded in our constitutional argumentation. So his methodology, he says, okay, well, number one, when the president acts pursuant to an express or implied authorization of Congress, his authority is at its maximum. So think about it like this. When Congress has expressly told the president or authorized, allowed the president to do something, the president's authority is at his greatest. And notice the word implied there. When Congress has implicitly given the president authority to do something. That one's really tricky. We're not going to get into that right now. But implied authorization is simply where Congress doesn't come out and clearly, explicitly say the president can do something, but by its actions, Congress agrees that the president can do something. Yeah, yeah, I know, that's confusing, but express or implied authorization is how we understand that. Either way, when Congress acts and authorizes the president to do something, the president's authority is at its greatest, which means very few questions can be asked. But number two is the tricky one. When the president acts in absence of either a congressional grant or denial of authority, he can only rely upon his own independent powers. And that's, there is a zone of twilight in which he and Congress may have concurrent authority. He, the presidency and Congress may share authority or the power might be distributed in an uncertain way. Is this zone of twilight argument. When the president acts, when the president does something and Congress has neither granted him authority or denied him authority to do something, the president is in a gray area. A zone of twilight. Yeah, the twilight zone. Think back to that 1960s show. A zone of twilight where he may or may not be acting constitutionally. Uh, it's up to judges to decide in that big gray area. In this area, any actual test of power is likely to depend upon the imperatives of events and contemporary imponderables. Interesting. Justice Jackson saying when the president enters that twilight zone, that gray area where he does something and Congress has neither said yay or nay, yes or no, it may well depend on events, the imperatives of events, uh, contemporary imponderables, unpredictable things that the president is facing. And and events and imponderables may outweigh abstract theories of law. Interesting. Finally, number three, when the president takes measures incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, his power is at its lowest. And he can rely only upon his own constitutional powers minus any constitutional powers Congress has over the matter. So what Justice Jackson has done is he's given us a formula, finally, after what, uh, over 150 years, a formula to figure out when the president is acting constitutionally or not. 
And to sum it up, so number one, when Congress explicitly or implicitly authorizes the president to do something, the president's power is at its greatest. So when Congress passes a statute authorizing the president to seize the steel industry, that, that didn't happen, whatever, but it may have, then the president can go seize the steel industry. Now, there might be other constitutional questions, but not questions about presidential power. When Congress has not spoken, when Congress is silent and has neither granted nor denied authority to the president, the president enters this gray area, this twilight zone, where courts will have to figure out if the president has the constitutional authority to do something based on the constitutional authority that Congress also has. This is where we get the president's power fluctuating based on its relationship to congressional power. And then finally, where Congress, <clears throat> excuse me, where Congress explicitly or implicitly <laughs> implied, uh, implicitly tells the president no, and he does something anyway, the president power is at its lowest. So that formula is very, very important. And according to Justice Jackson, you know, point number three of the formula applies here. The current seizure can be justified only by the severe test under the third grouping, where it can be supported only by any remainder of executive power after subtraction of such powers Congress may have. How did he get to that point? Well, he, after he gives us the three-part formula for judging presidential power, he goes on to point out several congressional statutes that prohibit the president from seizing property. And he reads those statutes as a grouping of Congress's will to deny this authority to the president. And Justice Jackson, based on his formula, agrees that the president, President Truman, has no authority to seize the steel industry. Now, I want to move on just very briefly here um, to cover just a couple of points in the dissenting opinion, which is quite long. So three just justices dissent. Uh, Justice Mitten, who was appointed by Truman, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, Truman thanked Mitten for at least helping him out a little bit, even though Truman lost. But the dissenting justices argue that basically in a time of crisis like this, the president has a duty to act. This is sort of, when you think about the prize cases that come creeping in. Um, where <clears throat> the Civil War Supreme Court determined that President Lincoln had an obligation, a duty to respond to the outbreak of the rebellion and the start of the Civil War, even though Congress was out of session. And the dissenting opinion spends a lot of time talking about all the various instances, historical examples of when presidents have acted on their own to meet a national crisis. And the dissents rely, they make it clear they're relying on a Hamiltonian vision of the presidency. Hamilton added, energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential. Energy in the executive is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks. It is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws, to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations, which sometimes interrupt the ordinary course of justice, so on and so forth. So the three dissenting justices make it quite clear they view this as a, as a Hamiltonian moment, almost. This is where the president is acting in an energetic manner. If we disagree, as they put it, if we follow, um, if we follow the reasoning of the majority, 
the president is left powerless at the very moment when he need when the need for action may be the most pressing. So um, you can read through on your own there uh, the dissent's use of historical examples. It's a very good example of using um, the history of, of of an institution here, the American presidency, and the history of presidential power to derive a constitutional conclusion. The argument, in a nutshell, would be based to a large extent on the practices, the past and historical practices of American presidents. The presidency does have the power to seize private property here in entire industry and operate it on behalf of the country. A crisis demands that kind of power. So it's an interesting case. The Youngstown Cheat and Tube versus Sawyer case, it's a classic American constitutional law case. And certainly when I teach it in class, you know, I like to give the background of it. But I I focus our attention in class on Justice Jackson's concurring opinion. Because like I said earlier, that three part formula he gives us for judging presidential power, that goes on to become constitutional law in a sense. That goes on to become uh, embedded in American constitutional law and politics. So I'll leave you with this. Harry Truman hated that decision. He hated the Supreme Court. He felt personally insulted by a couple of the justices in the majority that he had appointed. He was also very good friends with Robert Jackson. He just couldn't understand how Justice Jackson could betray him like that. Um, a word about Justice Jackson, and then I'll come back to President Truman. Like I said earlier, Justice Jackson spent several years in Nuremberg, Germany, prosecuting the top Nazi officials for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And that affected how Robert Jackson perceived executive power. And in the Youngstown Sheet and Tube case, and then in a, a couple of free speech cases, a U.S. versus Dennis in 1951, for example, Robert Jackson, Justice Jackson warns us about the growth of executive power and how it must be checked. He also warns us about the growth and the rise of political parties and how political parties in 1951 and 52 now have an outsized influence over how our constitutional institutions develop. And he got that thinking from his experience in dealing with the aftermath of totalitarian government in Europe at the end of World War II, uh, with fascist and Nazi political parties and, and war criminals. Let's go back to Harry Truman. I always like to end the class on this note. Um, Harry Truman had a regular poker game with many of those Supreme Court justices, you know, from the time he became president in the mid-1940s until he leaves the White House in, 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 in 1952, early 1953. Um, and President Truman met with those justices for his poker game, his weekly poker game, while the Youngstown case was being litigated. And some of the law clerks to the Supreme Court recall hearing about the poker game prior to the court's announcement of the Youngstown decision and how everyone in that room but Harry Truman knew the outcome of the case. And, you know, the justices themselves were sort of glum, evidently, you know, this is sort of third party information, sort of glum at that poker game and you know maybe Harry Truman got the sense that he was going to lose badly. After the court announces his decision, Justice Douglas and a couple of just other justices who regularly played poker with Truman called him up 
invited him, invited him over, not to the Supreme Court, but to another venue to just share a couple of bottles of bourbon, which is what they did. And evidently, after several bourbons, don't know how much, Truman was still angry, but he wasn't quite as angry as he was when the case decision was first announced. He left the White House still mad at the Supreme Court and the justices he appointed, but the bourbon made him feel a little better. Okay, well, thanks for joining me. Our last few lectures will be on the First Amendment Free Speech Clause, which should be really interesting. So I hope you'll continue on. Thanks.